USI 2021 at the beautiful Ritz-Carlton Laguna Niguel. It's nearly true tales of innovation. I'm your host, Benjamin Glenn. Say hello to my guest, Chris Vellis, here at LSI 2021. Chris, thanks for being with me. Well, thanks for having me. So how's the conference been so far? We're morning of day two. How was yesterday? There's so much going on in the conference. I mean, first, I'm just seeing so many friends and people that I haven't seen in the last 15 months and knowing that they're safe, knowing that they're alive, mm -hmm. hearing about the stories of those who have kind of made it through COVID themselves or some who unfortunately have lost family members during the course of the year. I mean, that's the first thing that kind of just, yeah. you know, hits me, yeah. hits me here. It's nice to see people. Um, I think the second thing is a recognition of the new trends that are, that are happening. I mean, I like to talk about convergence and how industries that weren't working together in med tech are now coming together to form new things, things we haven't seen before, how this old model of, uh, med tech, biotech, life science, and pharma as four different silos is now a way of thinking that is, is, is really uh, antiquated. That we really should be thinking instead of those technologies into dependent silos, thinking of uh, retail, consumer products, hospital care, insurance, telecommunications, med tech, biotech, and life sciences, all as part of the same industry and in delivering care to, to patients. And whether we realize it or not, during the period of COVID, this uh, intersection of industries has accelerated. And you can see the undertone of that in all the presentations um, at, at LSI. I, I actually think though, that the conference has had a focus still on uh, medical technology and that we're just sort of catching up with these ideas of industry convergence and integration. And I suspect if people come next year and the following year and the following year, what we'll see is the companies will better reflect the possibilities and the hope that that integration actually means for the delivery of care. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, earlier, we, we talked about the transition with uh, Formula One driving and the way that Formula One cars were made in the 70s and that very kind of manual and still lots of talent. But now if you look at an F1 car, the amount of technology that surrounds the driver and using that as an analogy for this technology that's gonna surround our surgeons and other providers and then bringing that technology into things that we don't normally think about, but how do we change payments? You know, how do we change reimbursement? Can we collect better data sooner, bigger, better data more robustly? And so I think we're going to see some of those technologies. What do you think about those kinds of trends? Well, I'm going to pick up on your analogy because I'm trained as a race car driver. And Are I you have, really? I have been through an entire program. Now, I don't actively race, but the discipline of, of racing to me is, is really interesting. And I, I think if I were to extend your, your metaphor analogy to go from F1 is to say that the technologies that F1 drivers currently have migrate into the cars that we drive exactly. at home. And I think that's really what you're going to see. You know, surgeons are the F1 drivers. And what you're going to see is those things that were typically happening in a physician's office, in a surgeon's office, and I'm not talking about open heart surgery here. I'm talking about diagnostics. I'm talking about uh, simpler procedures. Are gonna migrate from a hospital environment you're actually going to start seeing them in a retail environment, just like you're going to get care at CVS and Walgreens, Walmart, um, to, to our front door, to our home and our bedroom. And so that's like this transition from the Formula One technology with the ultra performance driver to what we actually have at home and can implement our, ourselves, right? And imagine how sophisticated your car is today compared to what it was in 1950. 
there you go. That's what's happening. That's what this conference is about. And that's what the people here are facilitating in, in the world. Yeah, I think that that's a great that's a great way to think about it. And it is because that technology does find its way into other products. And now you think about diagnostics and think about the screening technology. I was in law school in the 90s, and I think they got to about 75 percent of the human genome and they declared victory. But you think about how expensive that was. And now it's just a no brainer. You will sequence. I mean, we sequenced COVID rapidly because we've had what? decade and a half of hardcore implementation and driving technology into you know, genomic sequencing. Well, so let's go back to the 70s when you have this percentage of your genome, sort of uh, the, g the human genome decoded. Not yours personally, yeah. but the human genome. Last night we're sitting around the dinner table and we're all pulling up 23andMe mm -hmm. and we're pulling up our own genetic code, looking at where our ancestry is up from, talking about the fact that I think it was 89 or 93 percent of my ancestry is Greek, but yet the person sitting next to me was, I think, almost 30 percent Native, uh, Native American. And what other parts was that person? And we were all comparing. Now think about that, because that's another perfect analogy. You're talking about something that was specialized, only available in the laboratories, that we struggled to do, that now you send some saliva to a lab, and what happens is it's on your phone. Well. All of medicine is going to go in that direction, right? That's brought the genome into your home, into your personal relationships, into your family, and, and it's going to happen with medicine. It'll happen with procedures, it'll happen with diagnostics, it will happen with personal care, and it'll sort of bring these interventions that keep us healthy, keep us from getting sick, to, to life. I think that's the next thing you're really going to see is us being uh, uh, predictive and able to keep people well longer and out of the hospital, out of the care system. Yeah, it's interesting, to, just to pick up on that, um, we've been talking about orthopedics with some folks and do a lot with Orthopedic Research Society and it's a great way to you know, see, it's, it's a great mix, right? We've got strategics there, there's you know, just great researchers are there and then a lots of academic, just pulsating brains, right? So when you think about what we've seen in orthopedics, you know, 30 years ago, if you were 65 and you blew your knee out, I'm really sorry, you're gonna love these crutches. Oh, well, it's the same thing. Like, let's go back even further, right? I mean, we started in orthopedics with amputations, right? And, <laughs> That's and, right. and amputations went to fusions. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you wouldn't be able to maintain mobility in a knee or a hip, certainly not in That's a right. back. And still, you really can't maintain too much it's mobility. Not in spine. In the back, it's right? not there in spine. It's not there in spine. So then we migrate towards metal implants. And in a way, isn't that a little bit barbaric? But we, we go from that to smaller and smaller and less invasive and less invasive. But what's the next frontier, right? The next frontier is being able to predict those who are going to have degenerative cartilage disease or degenerative disc disease and be able to intervene beforehand in order to stop that degenerative process in order to give people more life, more mobility for a longer period as we're, as we're living longer. And that's going to be a really important thing. Right? Because as people, as the population grows, as people add years to their lives, they're going to have to live those years healthier or else what we're going to find is that it's going to crush our system. So it's by necessity that we're going to have to intervene earlier and sooner. And I think the next generation in orthopedics is, is going to be earlier interventions in order to stop those deterioration, stop that injury, more natural materials, less metal right. implants, um, and the implementation of surgical robotics, not to place pedicle screws, yeah. not just to place acetabular cups, yeah. but to do really complicated procedures right. that aren't possible at, at all today. At all, And that's kind of an area of interest for us, is going in a direction where we can make possible things that were just not possible at all in the, in the future. So in 100 years, that's a big gap from amputation Right, to think about regeneration. That's right. Yeah, no kidding. And it, it's, you know, just to pick up on that, um, you look at the changes by having like more real time imaging data in the orthopedic suite as opposed to what was surgical planning before. A, a foggy film that, because of their incredible skill, they can read it. Right. But to anybody else, it's like, really? It just looked like a bad photo. But that's what they planned. And now you're down to, no, it's going to be this size of implant. We're going to use this one. It'll be at this angle. All of that detail, it's really, I don't think it's ever going to replace the surgeon's skill. But I think the augmentation of the surgeon's skill, it's really, it's breathtaking to see what they're able to do now. You know, just to extend that discussion and just pick a time period sort of in the middle. 
I mean, there was a point where if you had a knee problem, you were going to get a total knee. Mm -hmm. Then you get partial knees. Right. right. Then you get companies coming out with uh, things to fix focal lesions, right, that are hidden under, often hidden under meniscal tears. That is going to turn into a biologic implant. And then it's going to turn into something that's preventive to stop that focal lesion from happening and identify it earlier. We're not there yet. But you're right. It's just a, it's a continuum of progress. And what I think is that that acceleration in care is going to go like this. It's going to happen at an at a accelerating logarithmic rate um, if we just uh, continue doing what's happened during the course of the last year. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, I think the, uh, I have a friend of mine that talks about when we look at like regenerative medicine within the context of orthopedics and putting something into the knee, you know, the amount of force, the amount of, it's like it, you really, once you begin to, it's one of the things I love about being in, in healthcare, right? You think about the way the body works. She says, it's like, you know, they, they make these things. It's like throwing it into a fireplace. I mean, it's really, there's a lot of friction. There's a lot of heat. There's a lot of load. So it's not just you've got to solve it. It's like a very complex material science problem. Imagine that, imagine the complexity, we take it for granted, but of a dental implant. Exactly. I mean, the forces in your jaw, on your teeth, are exceptional. I don't know what they are off the top of my head, but probably the strongest forces that you have anywhere in your body. And yet, we can take bone out, put a post in, put, put a new tooth on it, and have it withstand all of that pressure in your mouth the materials, the complexity, the, the, the ability to integrate it, is a, it's actually a miracle. You could give somebody a whole new set of teeth. And, you know, you think, well, geez, you know, that's not a big deal. Well, it is a big deal. <laughs> it's right. It is a big deal. You that's can right. smile and you can eat all of a sudden. That's right. And that's really impactful. But I think that's a simple way to kind of understand what we're seeing in every part of the body. And it's miraculous stuff we're able to do now. Yeah, it really is. Chris, tell us more about Meraki. What are you guys up to these days? Yeah. We're doing some really cool stuff. I mean, we have a unique way of thinking about starting companies because we like to start with a problem. Right? What's the big problem that we can solve? And then kind of search for what's the best technology that solves this problem? And not just wrap a team or a leader around it, but wrap an entire community around it that's interested in solving that problem. Mm -hmm. and, and this approach has allowed us to do some pretty amazing stuff. It started with the creation of Aura Surgical Robotics, Mm -hmm. uh, which I pulled Fred Mall into and eventually became part of Johnson & Johnson. Serapedics is another one where we solve the problems related to infuse and in the inflammatory response of infuse with a peptide that regenerates bone without the inflammatory response safely and can be used safely and is approved for cervical spine fusion. That migrated towards us being able to actually use cold temperatures to remove fat from people and contour their body, which in itself is very interesting because our, our, our sense of ourselves is so tied to how we look, how we feel. But it's also interesting because we're beginning to understand what fat is in a new way. Yeah. That it is a modulator of the hormones within our body. And the work that we're doing in that aesthetic field is helping us understand the impact across the entire industry and the issues around obesity. And then, and then finally, um, you know, Bow Biomedical is a company where we are solving the problems related to infectious disease. It is the only company in the world that has countermeasures that are pan-pathogenic, meaning it, it doesn't matter. Wow. Is it a virus? Is it a bacteria? Is it a protozoa? Is it a fungi? We can identify it almost instantly. We can track whether it's making a patient worse, and we can intervene with a filter that removes what are called PAMPs directly from the patient's blood. And those plant PAMPs are the, uh, uh, are the thing that incites the cytokine storm that you're hearing about a lot with COVID. If the PAMPs aren't there, it's logical that that cytokine storm and the rest of that inflammatory response shouldn't happen. And we're able to remove those and the pathogens directly from people's blood. So the philosophy of how to create companies and how to solve major problems is actually getting implemented and having an impact today on, on people's lives. And so for us, the future is to do more of this, to do it faster, to study it almost in an academic way and improve that process to get things to patients faster and faster and faster. And that's what Meraki is and that's, that's what we do. Chris, that's fantastic. That, I, I love the idea of uh, you know, wrapping a community around it. So I think ecosystem is so important. Uh, we, we have great centers of excellence all around the country, but there's always that hesitancy to deploy capital, oh, where am I going to get a team? How many, oh, will we be able to get hire people and have talent there? 
But I think if you can really be, if you can get that concept to stick to where you bring the problem to town and you wrap a community around it, and then that community gets those chops to be able to do more and do more, you're, you're training an army. They get it done. It's a force multiplier. It is a force multiplier. So if you take an idea and you take a technology and you say, you know what, we're going to take this from here to here. That's the goal, team. And you find people who are interested in solving that problem and give them some resources to move them in that direction. Mm -hmm. What you'll find is everybody will get on board and move in that direction. And it won't be just one leader who yeah. says, my technology, my technology. It won't just be a team. But what will happen is the physicians, the community, the researchers, the people who are involved or have family members who have the disease, all of a sudden start getting involved in what it is you're doing. And the force of that army moving towards mm -hmm. the solution is, is unstoppable. And if there was something in this that I could give to the entrepreneurs here through the experience of starting companies and being involved with, with med tech companies for a few decades now, that's it. Don't let your ego get tied to a technology and think that the technology is the company. The technology is that vision of where you're going. And it is saying, we want to solve this problem. Whether it's the thing I discovered or you discovered or she or he or they discovered doesn't matter. What matters is that you find the best solution and you wrap people around it and ask them for help. And when that happens, magic happens. And, and that's kind of what the conference is about, right? That's what that's right. Scott's really trying to facilitate here at the end is, is to bring emerging med tech companies together so we can learn and help each other uh, uh, facilitate helping patients. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think what, what we have also got here is we have a cross section of our ecosystem. And we've got strategics here, we've got investors here, there's startups here, there's established companies here, all the service providers and advisory around that. So you've got a little slice of it all coming together and helping them to have these insights and these visions. You know what, next year what we need to do is we need to drag in the retail companies that are providing healthcare, we need to drag in some of the hospital systems, we need to drag in uh, some of the consumer products companies that make, you know, phones and watches. We need to drag in some of the people who are involved in artificial intelligence and other industries and get them involved in what it is that we're doing because that is going to be a, just a, another force multiplier on us having a, an impact on the world. Yeah, health. Chris, I, I couldn't agree more because, you know, I'm up in Northern California, right? So, and even when I come back, I do a class in Boston or MIT and, and you know, they're working on hard problems. And I always tell them just, we need you to stay in this game. You keep doing the hard problems because believe me, somebody's working on whatever the next stupid thing we're gonna do on our phone, that's being worked on. But I think a lot of the kids that are up there around, you know, these young engineers, these young computer science that are coming up, I think if they, if they got the word that, you know, I know it's great, you're, you're doing, you've done a great job at Facebook, you know, I know Google loves you, but if you knew what your skills could do to the $4 trillion problem that we all share, I think that we would see them in droves because they're going to realize what I did a long time ago. I was a, I was a semiconductor guy when I got out of the Navy. And then I was like, whoa, in healthcare, you're, you really, you're, you do your job well, the company does well, people's lives change. There's not a whole lot of businesses where that actually happens. And I think that's, to me, that's the treat is that we participate, you do good work, you change people's lives. You know, we're giving them purpose and doing that too. Exactly right? Right. We're changing their lives that's right. so that when they're our age and older, Right? Those who are 20, 30 years old right now mm -hmm. can look back and say, what I did in the last decades was meaningful. It was meaningful to that individual. It was meaningful to the team I participated in. It was meaningful to the patients out there. So we got to drag them in and apply them to solving the problems that are, that are endemic on the, on the planet that relate to, relate to health. I think we got, got to go tell Scott we're going to need a fourth day for the conference. <laughs> I think you're Chris, right. thanks so much for spending time with me today. Thank you for doing this. I know you're talking to a lot of different people and trying to gather all of the thoughts together. It's really great that you're doing this and sharing, yeah. no, sharing it with the world. It's my good pleasure. Thanks for adding your it. voice to the conversation. Enjoy Welcome. the rest of the conference. Thank you. You too. Chris Bellis.